one of the most extraordinary things about your book, at least for me, was you really explain how important fungal species were to basically creating the biosphere as we know it and making it possible for plants to come onto dry land. And to this day that you say that 90% of plant species depend in some way on a relationship with fungal species, you know, to survive or to, or to function. So how is it, given how fundamental these, these fungi are to life on earth, that so little is known about them in so many domains, that there's so many mysteries still about them, that there's so few people studying them, and that so little money and research is being done comparatively compared to things like neuroscience or physics. So what's your opinion about that? How, I, because literally it's, we don't know, we don't understand the ground beneath our feet is the, the phrase that came to me. So why do you think that is? Yeah, it's a good question and a really important one for us to reckon with because our neglect of this kingdom of life is uh, not only allowing us and causing us to do harm to the biosphere, ecocidal harm, um, but it's also um, doing harm to ourselves because we can't cultivate plants in a good way. We can't do any kind of agriculture in a good way unless we take account of plants' life support systems and fungi are a big part of plants' life support systems. So I think there are a few reasons why this is such a neglected kingdom of life. W one of them is that most of fungal life is lived hidden from our view. You know, we see mushrooms as pop up above the ground, but most fungal life is lived either as single-celled, um, invisible to our eyes, at least micro, um, micro fungi like yeasts, and otherwise as mycelial networks, which live their lives uh, entombed in their food source. So uh, because they insinuate themselves within their source of food, they burrow into their source of food to digest it, uh, they're necessarily obscured by their source of food, so they're out of our sight. So I think part of it is because this is hidden, and only recently have we developed suitable technologies to really investigate their behavior. So technologically, now we have DNA sequencing, which allows us to profile microbial communities in the soil, in, in animal and plant tissues, etc., which has given rise largely to this um, revolution in our understanding of microbes in general. Uh, and the microbiome in general, uh, simply because we can uh, we investigate this world in a way that we couldn't before. So there's that um, technological advances that allow us to um, access this world. And then also there are disciplinary issues. So fungi weren't considered to be their own kingdom of life uh, until the 60s. So they were lumped in with plant sciences. They were sort of the, sort of the kind of plant, and so they didn't have their own university departments. Uh, there are departments of animal sciences, department of plant sciences, but no departments of fungal right? science. Exactly. We have, a, we have a deeply entrenched disciplinary bias because of this taxonomic um, wrinkle, which has now been resolved in favor of fungi. They've won their independence, and so are bacteria. Um, but because of that, you'd have mycologists would be in the plant sciences department at a university, and they'd be you know, in a dusty corner of the plant sciences department in the university uh, with... Uh, having to split their funding with the plant sciences department, the other people in the plant sciences department. So that's a big reason, I think, that we don't see um, so much research and funding going to the mycological sciences today. And um, there are other reasons. I mean, um, let's see, where to start? There are, and there's a deeply entrenched a suspicion of fungi culturally in many parts of the world. You don't find this so much in East Asian countries, China and Japan, they are mycophilic historically. You know, they're right. great, inter great interest in fungi. It's mycophobic, mycophilic distinction, right? The, uh, Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I don't think this is a distinction that we should use to, um, to govern our lives in a, in a major way, but you definitely see uh, cultural aversion um, to, to fungi and you see cultural attraction to fungi in some parts of the world. So, and Anglo-Saxons have historically been somewhat mycophobic and so, because so much science is done in English these days, uh, that could be another reason, right? For exactly, yeah. So, so there are these there are these various reasons, but thankfully this is starting to change, and hopefully we're going to see um, a much bigger investment in the fungal sciences and a much bigger much bigger attention um, and and more uptake within within the student body. You know, with young people getting excited about fungi and, and deciding to go into the, do research on fungal subjects. So the, the, the next uh, thing I wanted to discuss with you, which was really fascinated me, um, and I want to get into the whole issue of metaphors and symbiosis versus uh, 
social Darwinism, but um, the fact that lichens were the sort of gateway to symbiosis as, as a concept in, in Western science was really fascinating to me. Um, so maybe if you could explore that a little bit. First of all, you know, it's really the first organism where science is forced to reckon with the fact that it's not a discrete organism, but a symbiont. And then that in recent years, very recent years, we discover that it's actually a more complex symbiont than we, than we even thought. So maybe talk a little bit about that, uh, about symbiosis and lichens. Of course. So lichens are these iconic organisms uh, because of this, I think, and have really been this gateway for our understanding of a, of a, a reciprocal and mutually beneficial cooperation in the natural world. And before lichens came along, um, or before we had turned our attention to lichens within the um, European modern sciences, there were, um, there were only two ways really to think about the intimate sharing of bodily space with microbes, because we were living in the period of the germ theory of disease. And so if something lived in close contact with another organism, lived on or in their body, it was sort of as a germ, a, a germ an agent of disease, or a parasite of some sort, another kind of agent of disease. Uh, so when people started studying lichens and uncovering this, this anatomy, which is a shared anatomy, a, a, a dual anatomy, um, Simon Schwendener, the botanist who came up with this, uh, the dual hypothesis of lichens, he called it. And um, he, was, he was laughed out of the house because it, it seemed preposterous that you could have a, a mutually beneficial uh, sharing of bodily space. So this was not something which was conceivable within the frameworks of biological thought at the time. And so uh, a few years later, Albert Frank, another biologist, coined this word symbiosis to describe the living together of, of, of fungus and of alga, of the photosynthetic component in lichens. And he coined this term symbiosis to, to, to have a term to describe in a non-judgmental way the sharing of bodily space. Symbiosis could mean parasitism, it could mean pathogen, but it could also mean something more than that. And so suddenly we had this way of, we have a word to describe um, something more than parasitism and pathogenicity. And so um, the, the, the biological prospects opened up. And it was in the wake of that, a coining of that term, that the symbiotic nature of corals and of other sea organisms um, and of plants and mycorrhizal fungi. These were all discovered in the wake of this word symbiosis. So it's a really good example of the way that um, words do work for us conceptually. Yeah, they open up a, a possibility for something that we couldn't see before. So mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to explore that a little bit more, more the metaphor, because you talk a lot about um, the sort of battles of metaphors in this realm. And you know, so what you just described where we went from a kind of very primitive social Darwinism where everything has to be competition and nature red in tooth and claw into this idea that symbiosis in nature was possible. And then, you know, we already see that in someone like von Humboldt and then with Kropotkin with mutual aid in, in, as a factor in evolution in 1902. And then more recently, you know, this idea of symbiosis and the sort of cuddly, friendly view of nature um, that we get with, you know, modern scientists like Suzanne Simard and David Feed who study, uh, the, you know, relationships of trees uh, with mycorrhizal networks. And there are sort of the family metaphors of, you know, communities of trees and sharing nutrients and so on. Um, and so there's this whole sort of battle of, of metaphors um, and it seems really important because in a way these metaphors are important. We can't live without them. And at the same time, they can lock us in whether we, you know, are rabid social Darwinists where we're locked into this idea of competition or we become kind of going too much the other way and think everything is warm and fuzzy in nature. So yeah, discuss that a little bit because you have some really fascinating parts in the, in the book. Um, yeah. So. I think it's most helpful to think of cooperation as always this alloy of competition. Um, so of collaboration as always an alloy of co cooperation and competition. So we work together with other organisms, other humans, think of families, think of jazz bands, any kind of collaboration. There's always a bit of cooperation, a bit of competition. And these um, dynamics are, are just basic facts of our social lives. And I think we can extend that to uh, the more than human world. And, if we think of collaboration as always this blend, um, 
then I think we just enter a bigger room and it doesn't have to be, is nature fundamentally competitive or is nature fundamentally cooperative? Um, competitive comes from the Latin to strive together. So it's, it's, it's also nice to, to think of competition in, in different ways. You know, competition doesn't just mean one thing. Um, so, so yeah, so but I think metaphors are obviously, they're, they're, it's a non-negotiable uh, feature of our, our lives, you know, whether, whether we're scientists or, or not. And we have to use metaphors to understand uh, and process and discuss um, and conceive of ideas. And in the sciences, they're essential because most of science is to do with phenomena which are out of the reach of our immediate senses. And so that means that we're always striving to understand, striving to describe, striving to come up with images for um, things and phenomena that we, we aren't able to detect directly. So metaphors are, um, are always going to be there. And so we may as well make peace with that fact and then try to work out how it is that we can use metaphors to our best advantage. And I think the main thing is to remember that we're using a metaphor when we're using a metaphor, rather than letting our metaphors become fact, uh, rather than to forget that we are telling a story, to remember that we're telling a story and that there are different stories that we can tell. Ideally, we want a plurality of stories about various phenomena. I think it it's what the Buddhists to... call not mistaking the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself, right? That for thing <laughs> yeah. that phrase. Exactly, yeah. And then the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead called it the fallacy of uh, misplaced, concreteness, con misplaced concreteness. So um, when we mistake our maps for reality. And so, yeah, so, so I think these, you know, all these metaphors are, uh, help us to see in different ways these dynamics that we're studying. And um, as long as we remember that they're metaphors, remember that there's a healthy variety of metaphors on offer and that we should have a balanced narrative diet. Um, then well, that's, I that's think the hard well. part because I think there are both, you know, um, kind of the rigid scientific establishment at time, forget that, and then the counterculture or the radical mycology wing, which we'll get into in a little bit, also forgets that. And uh, sometimes the map, um, you know, uh, people get trapped in their own maps, I think. I mean, I think some Absolutely. of the, you know, we, we, a lot of interesting metaphors come up in the, in the mycelial world where, you know, the wood wide web is one, and then, which is obviously inter internet and, I mean, Paul Stamets actually calls it the mycelial internet, I think. Uh, and, and then, you know, also metaphors for neuroscience, that these are like neural connections. And they're useful, they're all useful, but I think some people do go overboard and identify um, with the metaphor so much that it becomes limiting, in my view, but that's mm -hmm. As we do, I, I think all, all humans are vulnerable to this, and I certainly fall into this trap. Um, I think it's actually very helpful to use fungal networks themselves as metaphors to understand other phenomena. I think it's quite nice to flip those roles and to see these mycelial networks as great uh, metaphor metaphorical uh, feedstock for our other discussions and um, uh, perusing and using. You just used a great metaphor there for, you know, <laughs> which will set up some of our conversation. But um, so actually that's a, a very good um, launching place for the next question I have, which is um, mycelial networks are really, I mean, uh, they're a, a great gateway again to use that, that term to, to understand that nature um, can no longer be understood as sort of a, a competition between discrete species with precise boundaries that can be, you know, you just look up a taxonomic, you know, distinction and you find the particular species. It's so clear from, from your book that there are these incredibly complex networks where it becomes impossible to differentiate species and that everything is sort of an active um, functioning whole system that's ever shifting in its boundaries. It reminded me a bit of this idea, again, I'm not a Buddhist, but to cite a Buddhist idea in Buddhism, this idea that there's no self as we think of it, that whenever we think of the self, we think of our body, but we're actually breathing in other, other species all the time. And now with the microbiome, we exist with all these bacteria and viruses without which we couldn't function. Um, so, or we think of our minds and our ideas, but obviously they came from elsewhere, from our education. So it seemed to me very similar, this idea um, that once you really look at, at the fungal world, it's impossible to think of it as anything but this incredibly complex shifting system um, in which it's very hard to differentiate one, a particular species. Um, so I guess that all of ecology teaches us that more and more, but the, the fungal world seems to be really the prime example 
And it's amazing how little we understand about it, getting back to that, that first point. Um, yeah, it, it, and it's so complex. I mean, it seems more complex than neuroscience to me, just from your descriptions. Um, in terms of these uh, relationships, because neuroscience is at least housed within, you know, within a particular box, you know, when you're studying the brain. So um, anyway, what are your thoughts Absolutely. about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, that's one of the ways that I really um, found my interest in fungi developing was this idea that there are these literal connections between organisms and ecology deals with these connections between organisms. All organisms are open systems um, and are in constant interplay with their surroundings, whether they be other organisms or um, you know, biogeochemical cycles or, and, um, or physical features of the world. And so ecology deals with these connections between organisms, the relationships formed between organisms, but fungi form actual physical connections between organisms. So they make this um, basic fundamental feature of ecology uh, literal. You actually have a connection between these organisms, say in the case of the wood wide web. Um, you have physical uh, persistent linkages between organisms. So it's impossible not to see this. They make it very obvious and very easy for us to understand the interconnectedness of the natural world. And so I think that they're, they're a, great, um, a great reminder, a kind of mnemonic of this, of this basic feature of, of life and of the physical universe. Um, so I wanted to jump into, um, you know, this fascinating aspect of your book is that you have one foot in each of two different worlds, one very firmly planted in rigorous science in academia. I mean, you have a you know, doctorate in tropical ecology and your, your academic uh, and you know, scientific credentials are, are tip top and you have you know, almost 50 pages of bibliography. And so you're obviously an extremely serious and rigorous scientist, but you also have um, you know, from your childhood a unique exposure to the counterculture, which we can get into a, a little bit later because it's fascinating. But you describe in your book, um, you know, the, the scientific work that's being done, you know, in the academy, but also this very fascinating, very dynamic movement of sorts of radical mycology, you call it, um, which includes people like our good friend Paul Stamets, who we know quite well, and um, the Peter McCoy. And it's really fascinating because I was wondering if there's any tension there for you, because it's a difficult, um, these are very two very different worlds. And an enormous amount of great interest is happening in that radical mycology world. But there's a lot of, you know, the type of enthusiasm and, um, uh, and linguistic enthusiasm that academics really frown upon, you know. So how do you reconcile that tension? Because in a way, you're, you're in both those worlds in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an interesting question because, yeah, we think of academia as, um, as sort of inward looking, uh, an inward looking community of scholars who talk with each other and not so much to the wider world. Um, but the development of the natural sciences over the course of the last few hundred years has really been driven by amateur, uh, passionate enthusiasts, amateur coming from the Latin to love. You know, this is a, this is a matter of passion and this is not an uh, amateur in a derogatory sense. Um, but much of the inquiry that humans have done in this modern Western scientific context into the natural world has been done in an amateur context because there weren't other places to do it. Um, there weren't necessarily degrees or university departments where you could go and make this kind of investigation. So, so I mean, Darwin's a great example. You know, he, Darwin has, um, does experiments on earthworms in his garden. He has racing pigeons. He's chatting with pigeon breeders and pigeon fanciers and different varieties of apple in his garden. He competes with his cousin every year to who can grow the biggest pear. It's uh, so much family entertainment. Um, so this is he's a great example of this. So and in the fungal sciences, because they haven't had this disciplinary uh, context and a disciplinary home for that long, there's been, I mean, the, no, the American Mycological Society was the first you know, big mycological society was founded in the 70s. This is very, very fresh. Um, but so much of mycological inquiry has been the province of amateurs in a good sense. And, um, and so I see radical mycology, this is Peter McCoy's term, I, I use it a bit more broadly to describe people who are trying to use fungi to um, produce radical solutions to many of our big problems. Um, so you can see them as just part of this bigger dynamic within the natural sciences. Uh, people who are uh, doing their own investigations outside the purview of, of formal departments. So I don't really see so much of a tension. Um, I just see them contributing different, uh, different types of n knowledge and expertise which are available to, I mean, radical mycologists can do 
uh, more wild and free type of exp uh, um, experimentation because they're not, they don't have to fill in um, forms. They're also very the result oriented. You know, they want, mm -hmm. you know, they want to use it for micro, you know, mycological bioremediation of toxins and to create new mm -hmm. kinds of packaging in the ecovative case. And, and of course, mm -hmm. we're getting high, but that's, a, you know, um, well, which we'll get into in a minute. But mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, um, it's a fascinating world, but it, it does seem, um, I, I loved you have a quote in your book where um, some academic mycologist is telling you, you know, Merlin, we don't know what to do. We want to study yeast, but these young people want to save the world. I thought that was... <laughs> yeah, that was, that was someone talking to Paul Stamets, actually, and they said, Paul, what do we do? <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I think that really sums it up. Um, this is exactly what you, what you describe. Um, but it's funny, you know, and, and, and there would be few academic mycologists who would argue with the fact that um, their, their, their student recruitment numbers had gone up hugely because of the work of Paul and others who are uh, these mycovangelists, you might, take, might call them, who have spread, spread this passion and enthusiasm for fungi. So um, I think they very much work together. Uh-huh. Well, great. Um, it's probably one of the few domains, and perhaps because it is so marked by that, um, by that foundation by amateurs, as you say, you know, there's a, you are, you, you, this is an aside, but you really have that, um, the quality of those great 19th century, you know, uh, naturalist generalists, because you seem, you know, a, a part of it, I think might be your, you know, sort of um, family background sort of steeped in this kind of excellent British erudition and, and uh, broad intellectual vision. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I admire that in your writing in that you, you had this sort of elegance and a lot of literary references and philosophical references. So you, you, there is a quality in the best possible sense of the sort of the 19th century, the von Humboldt type naturalist, you know, except you're obviously equipped with much better microscopes and, uh, and <laughs> DNA analysis. So uh, it's the best of both worlds in a sense. Anyway, um, mm. uh, so one thing that I want to get into, because I think people will be very interested, is a little bit of your personal story and how that relates to the whole uh, psychedelic aspect of this, because I know many of the people who will watch this have some interest in, in psilocybin. And I love just um, the anecdote you tell of being seven years old and your father visiting Terence McKenna and that you're there and, and you have a, a bad cold and you're in bed and Terence McKenna comes in the room and you think he, he starts mixing up herbs and you think he's preparing something to help you heal. But of course, Terence is completely obsessed with psychedelics and actually he's mixing up a bunch of salvia divinorum. I thought that was so typically Terence, you know, that uh, um, I love that story. But so you have this unique backstory of having been introduced to many of these sort of radical mycological figures um, in the psychedelic domain from a very young age. Um, but yet you describe your entry point into the psychedelics, at least in the book, with an LSD experience in which you were trying to find some creative uh, way into a particular research project you were doing, right? Um, so had you not had a bunch of experience with psilocybin, or if, you, if you're comfortable discussing it, I don't know, before that, or were you kind of, because of some of the people you had known reticence to get too deeply immersed in, in that world or yeah what is your um to the extent you're comfortable discussing it what is your psychedelic uh trajectory um, yeah good question um so i mean terence was a a big figure in my life and and has this obviously a very amazing ability to tell stories and when you're small and stories are a bigger part of one's life um these you know he's very very charismatic and, and powerful teller of tales um, and that left a big impression on me and so no I was interested in the I've been interested in these subjects I haven't um, rejected them and when I was a teenager there was a big ma magic mushroom boom in England and Holland because it was legal to sell uh, magic mushrooms on the street on high streets as long as they were fresh there was a loophole in the law and so this lasted this boom lasted about two years and then it was closed down by the government. But in this period of time, I did experiment with them and because you just walk down the high street and there's people selling crates of this stuff, just perfectly openly. Um, people are writing about it in ways that they haven't been able to write about it before. So there was this period of great experimentation on a, on a kind of national scale. And so I participated in that and I think that really um, ignited an interest in these topics and in these subjects um, and in these substances. 
um, to change the way that we think, feel, and imagine. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, I found particularly interesting, well, you have a big interest um, in yeast and alcohol, but we'll get it, uh, we can save that for, for a bit later. But um, you get into a discussion of some of Terence's idea, because I knew Terence also, and Terence was one of the great um, storytellers, as you say, for, you know, perhaps he had the greatest gift of gab of just about any, any uh, human being. But many of his ideas, you know, in my view, some of his more ambitious philosophical ideas, like the stoned monkey theory of, of evolution and psilocybin, you, you take a, you know, a, f a very friendly and open-minded but skeptical view of some of those ideas. And you point out, interestingly, that, the, that psilocybin mushrooms developed psilocybin millions of years before there were hominids walking around. So obviously, um, and, and that raises a whole issue because I think that the psychedelic world has a tendency, um, there's something about the psychedelic substances themselves and then something about the, the subculture that creates a, a very passionate, enthusiastic and uh, exuberant um, linguistic universe. And a lot of people get experiences in which they feel they're relating to an alien intelligence, to a plant intelligence or to, um, and it's a very powerful subjective feeling for many people. But that's hard to reconcile, you know, with, anyway, with a more, you know, um, dispassionate uh, look at the natural. So how do you, do you have that problem? Do, you're trying to reconcile your subjective experience with what you know or what you can entertain um, with your, your sort of more cold, uh, cold headed observation of the natural world? Well, I think that that dynamic you describe reflects a bigger dynamic within the natural sciences, which struggles to reconcile the existence of consciousness and subjective experience at all with this materialist, unconscious, purposeless universe, which we're told is the, um, which is the fact of, of creation of, of what exists. So I feel like this tension is one tension that exists very much in the natural sciences at large, and it's, it's called the hard problem of consciousness. Why should subjective experience exist at all, you know, given that matter is inert, purposeless, um, and lacks every kind of quality, lacks meaning, um, lacks every kind of quality that we find in consciousness. Um, the existence of consciousness is a great puzzle. So yeah, so it's, it is a thing, you know, you can experience consciousness from the inside only by definition. Um, so these subjective experiences in a psychedelic, uh, in a psychedelic setting, are, um, are are remarkable and puzzling. But so are our subjective experiences in any setting, um, and that helps me ground my thinking about psychedelics because it makes it all seem a bit less peculiar. I mean, it makes the psychedelics seem less peculiar relative to non-psychedelics, but it makes um, consciousness overall seem more peculiar. Mm -hmm. um, Do you? have any sympathy for panpsychic philosophies, you know, that feel that consciousness is embedded um, in the universe at every level? I mean, that's, um, you know, there's a long tradition of that in the West in very many different forms. Um, but that's, that's yeah, I do. Radical. Yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. I do. I find it very hard to imagine how, how we could go from meaningless, purposeless, purposeless, um, qualityless, um, feelingless, experienceless matter <laughs> into rich, subjective, lived experience. And unless some of those qualities were a fundamental feature of the matter that, and the energy that makes us up. So I, um, I do have time for it, absolutely. I think it's a fascinating field of inquiry and one that's really starting to um, help us to answer some bigger questions about the natural world and our place in it. Good. So. Um, Another great passion of yours, which there, you, there are some great stories about, is your love of um, fermenting. And uh, you're a great fermenter. Um, I especially love that idea of stealing Newton's apples um, to, to make hard cider. That was an extraordinary story. I, we probably don't need to give it away so people will have reason to buy the book. But um, so where, where did this passion for, um, or fermentation come. I, you tell a great anecdote about being very young and your father explaining decomposition to you of, of, of leaves and how that was foundational um, in your interest in, in the natural world. But um, yeah, where did that passion for yeast and for fermentation come from? And 
has it gotten you in trouble at all? Um. <laughs> Good question. So I think the, yeah, this interest in decomposition, why do things change? You know, why, does, why do things transform? How does a log turn into soil? Um, these are fascinating questions. And when I found out about decomposition, this was just huge news. You know, how is it that, that you know, we live in the space that decomposition leaves behind? Um, we live and breathe in this space. And so the organisms that decompose the world are fundamental to everything we know and everything we can do. And, um, but we see it most of all um, by what is left behind, the empty space that is left behind, the negative space that is left behind. So it's hard for us to notice all the time. Um, so then that was a big moment for me and, and continues to drive my interest in, in microbes and fungi um, and these other organisms that decompose and rearrange the world. But that's partly why I like fermentation. I find this such a, a comforting and, and fascinating process because you have essentially a de um, domesticated decomposition. You're, you're, you're channeling this biogeochemical process and you're uh, housing it within a jar in your kitchen in a way that you can not only see, um, not only smell, but taste. So you can taste the, the chemical transformations that are taking place over time. Um, it's easier to taste that than to taste soil or to taste a rotting log. We're encouraged not to do that as children, but um, maybe it would be good for us. But um, so fermentation is a way to really notice, to really know with, with, with as many senses as possible um, this transformational power of microbes and microorganisms to, to, um, to arrange and rearrange the world. So that's, I think, underlies my fascination with fermentation, apart from the amazing flavors, the health benefits, whatever, the, um, the delicious drinks you can make. So there are lots of reasons why um, I think it's a great thing to be doing. And um, another reason is that it connects us with our history, because fermentation has been a big part of human life for as long as we can know. Um, because before fridges, how do you preserve food? You know, we have gluts of food and we need to preserve them. And almost all those preservation techniques are fermentative ones. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an on-running interest of mine and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And ha so, but it hasn't gotten you in trouble. You haven't found yourself inebriated well, occasionally. Uh, well, I mean, sometimes we, it, it depends if, you know, with the apples, like I, I made after the Newton cider, I made one with my brother Cosmo and my father we wanted to make one out of darwin's apples um we'd call this one evolution so we had to go and get darwin's apples from down house not his which pears. Can... Not his pears. <laughs> no not the pears um but um so he has apple there are apple trees growing in the grounds of his garden and so we had to go there and get the apples and that involved a little bit of um you know my father had to stand by the gateway to the orchard and uh, yeah, you're admitting people. crimes in the theft of newton's apples you know, so. i know we're scrumping it's it's i mean it, it used to be a bigger crime because cider had value you know most of the time these apples just fall onto the floor and rot into a mess so i don't feel like i'm in a terrible moral quandary with taking these apples um but you know you've got to be a bit careful um, about whose apples they are um so newton's hmm. non-gravitational uh you know the the false story of the apple falling from the tree of it. Uh, anyway, it's a yeah. great tale. I recommend that people read the book to get the, to get the full anecdote. But, uh. <laughs> so is there any, anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Any particular, um, you know, uh, insights or things that you think are most important to convey? Um, I, I've been, I've got to say, really very impressed with how favorably your, your book has been reviewed because Sometimes it's very difficult, but like my friend Jeremy Narby, his book Intelligence in Nature, you know, um, which I think made some really fascinating points and was quite rigorous, did not get uh, taken seriously. I know your father back in the day sometimes was not treated well by the scientific establishment, uh, unfairly in my view. So, um, but you seem to have really, uh, perhaps the times have changed, you know, but um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, I'm impressed that the world is so open to um to this to, to your take on things and to some extent you're a great ambassador you have really found that um a way of being very delicate and very um diplomatic and at the same time fully immersed in all the aspects of the of the topic so have you been surprised by how how well it, it's done and how um how great the reviews have been or um or were you expecting it all along no, I definitely wasn't expecting it. I had no idea what to expect, and so I was very, I was very encouraged to, um, to find this this very friendly, and warm 
reception and it's it's encouraging to me because it's a subject I'm so interested in and it's just nice when people share, can share your interests you know, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book so on a very on a very sort of homely kind of level um, I was just happy that people were also could get keen about the subject um, but I think it's a, it's a lot about the time we're in you know we're in a time of great crisis of course we've been in crisis for a while but that, that crisis is coming to a head and people's awareness of this crisis many crises um, the many social and environmental injustices that we are being destroyed by. Um, and so I think there's a big openness to revisiting and re-examining some of the concepts that we use to structure our understanding of the world we live in. And I think fungi can provide really a helpful way into this kind of restructuring and they can change the way that we think, feel and imagine and, and worry some of our well-worn concepts that we use to organize the world. And if people are at a time when they really want to start worrying those concepts, then I think there's going to be a more favorable reception to it. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why, um, why people have been friendly. And, um, and also, we live in it, it's a very it's a very fungal moment for us. You know, we, we live in this in the midst of these networks. The network has become a master concept, and uh, partly because of the um, the rise of the internet and the World Wide Web and the way that our lives have become continuous with these digital systems, these digital network systems. But also, network science in general is being used to make sense of almost everything you can imagine, and um, so fungi, which are um, our networks are ancient networks, billions of years old, um, or at least a billion years old, and which are um, which perform all these astonishing um, phenomena and, and illustrate the foundational uh, nature of networks and the network nature of the universe. And um, so, I think that's also one of the reasons why it's, people are interested in fungi at this moment. Um, of course, there have been many people talking and. Um, talking very passionately about fungal lives for much longer than me. Uh, Paul Stamets is a good example, Peter McCoy is another, but there are many. Um, and so, um, so I feel like I'm just, it's just adding to the conversation that was already going on. Um, yeah, no, I think that that's right. But I think because they're so passionately in the trenches, there's something about your book that provides sort of an overview of the whole topic from many different angles that's very useful and that hadn't been done before. Mm. So I think mm. that, um, yeah, no, we, we love Paul. I mean, how can one not love Paul? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a big inspiration. Um, but this is the thing, you know, when you start exploring the fungal world, um, you know, that great line, um, John, was it John Muir? Um, I think it's John Muir, one of the great the American naturalists. They do tug on anything, tug on any, uh, tug on anything in the um, universe, and you find it hitched to everything else. You know, when when you study fungi, because they live their lines wrapped around other organisms and um, embedded within features of the natural world, it's really like that. You can't think about fungi without thinking about other organisms, because fungi, you, you know, you, a, a fungal network separate from its environment is. Um, you, know, you grow a fungal network in one situation and another situation, and they'll be completely different organisms. So um, you have to think about context. You have to think about interactions. You have to think about symbiosis. You have to think about the interconnection of all things when you think about fungi. So for me, this was, fungi were a very, like a gateway organism, a gateway life form, a gateway kingdom of life um, into um, thinking about um, life and ecosystems in general. And so that's really what was fun for me in the book was um, following these threads and then finding yourself in a completely different place than where you started. And that's why I think um, fungi make such good explanatory um, organisms and, and such good model organisms for us to learn, um, to understand and reimagine. Maybe they'll be the gateway to um, the triumph of whole systems thinking. You know, maybe it'll be via fungi that um, the establishment will have no, no choice but to, to accept a more complex ecological view of the world. So. Mm -hmm. What are your plans? Do you have any research projects that you're um, particularly interested in at the moment? Yeah, there's a few uh, possible ones. I have, I have lots of work to write up that I haven't yet written up from before. So I've got a lot of, um, a lot of sort of desk type research work to, to continue with. And the book's definitely been my preoccupation for the last couple of years. Um, and, yeah, and then so many experiments to do, you know, there's, there's so many aspects of fungal lives that are, um, that are unknown and underexplored. And so 
I'm really excited to, to do further work into a number of these phenomena. Um, how exactly that will play out, I'm not sure, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting prospect. The, the more that you, more you ask, the more there is to ask. <laughs> well, anyway, congratulations again, and I think we can, we can end here, but um, really hoping to hear and uh, read much more from you in the coming years. So. Thanks so much. It's been great to chat.